thank you all for um, coming today. Um, this is my first time uh, to uh, Skibbereen, in fact, um, and to the West Cork History Festival. And it was a real honour to be asked to uh, speak about this particular exhibition, which actually closed to the public uh, tomorrow, uh, this day tomorrow last year. And it was an exhibition that came at an absolutely amazing time in the gallery's kind of uh, recent history in that it opened just uh, while we were relaunching the gallery. So um, relaunching the newly renovated wings, we had huge kind of uh, media coverage, etc., cetera, um, on the news and the TV. And so it was an incredibly busy time within the gallery. And it was kind of serendipitous for me because the exhibition opened at a time when we had literally just were finishing an exhibition on Caravaggio and launching a massive exhibition on Vermeer. So here was Margaret Clark placed in the middle of these two gargantuan um, artists. But nonetheless, I feel she held her own. Um, so my aim with this particular exhibition was basically to reevaluate her work. She was, of course, once a well-regarded member of the artistic establishment whose reputation had sadly faded from view. Happens quite a lot with women artists, unfortunately. Um, but she was, in her own time, the second uh, female artist after Sarah Purser to have been elected a full member of the Royal Academy um, of Art. So quite a feat at that time, I would have thought. Um, and her work, I felt, deserved to be brought back um, into the light. The exhibition examined the development of her style um, from her time at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, where she studied under William Orpen, uh, right through to her later period where she produced a number of really striking um, works based on, a, on really diverse themes. Immediate likenesses of her own family and close friends, attesting to her immense skill as a portraitist, um, were shown alongside some of her commissioned pieces. I'm just thinking, is this my little uh, gizmo for um, moving on? Great. And hopefully, a lot of these paintings are very, very richly coloured, so hopefully you're able to, um, to see some of that uh, within... Uh, the slides here. So uh, I suppose within the exhibition as well, what I wanted to show was the fact that she was a superb painter and draftsperson. Um, and this was presented through a wide range of works. Also, the challenges that she faced as an artist, uh, balancing family life and the management of the Harry Clark Studios after her husband's death in 1931, um, I also uh, addressed. The story of her life uh, with the artworks that were on display were what I believe uh, drew people to this exhibition. People, of course, knew who Harry Clark was, but they didn't necessarily realise that he, number one, was married to an artist and an artist that happened to be a very good one. Um, I got the sense from visitors that uh, attended this exhibition that they really, really connected with the personal story of her life. Um, and hence returned more than once with different family members. The exhibition provided an opportunity to bring over 40 of the artist's highly accomplished paintings and drawings to an audience of 60,000 people. Many artworks brought together for, uh, to this exhibition for the first time were sourced from both public and private collections throughout the island of Ireland and England. Collectors and public ex um, institutions alike were delighted, I felt, to lend to the exhibition, as they too were of the opinion that Margaret Clark deserved a dedicated show. So, providing a compre comprehensive overview of her oeuvre, I believe I achieved my goal of repositioning her as a significant figure in the history of early 20th century Irish art. The catalogue for the exhibition had to be reprinted um, a couple of times throughout the run of the show. And again, for me, that attested to the fact that people were interested in knowing more about her. This, of course, is her self-portrait of 1914. And for me, I think this is a self-portrait that really shows some of that kind of self-assured, um, independent character um, and alludes, in a sense, to uh, her determination to basically succeed as a professional artist. Just to give you a little bit of background about who Margaret was, 
She was born um, Margaret Crilly um, in Newry in County Down in 1884. She was a strong, independent-minded character, and she was determined, really, from an early age to pursue a career as a professional artist. She exhibited, really, um, regularly at the Royal Hibernian Academy from 1913. So, as I said, this is um, 1914, so one of her um, first uh, forays into being a professional artist. Reviewing her solo exhibition of 1924 in the studio, Thomas Bodkin, who would become director of the National Gallery of Ireland, um, referred to Margaret as Mrs. Clark, the wife of Mr. Harry Clark, and one of the most brilliant of that remarkable group of students, which Sir William Orpen fostered. So in response, Margaret drafted a letter to him, and she responded by saying, I hope I shall be able to attract your appreciation of my individual efforts as a painter, underlined, rather than the fact that I am the wife, underlined, of one artist and the pupil, underlined, of another. So she very much put him in his place from, from the get-go. So as I said, only three years after her writing this letter, she did become the second woman artist after Sir Purser to be elected a full academician at the RHA. Um, and as I said, she was admired by her contemporaries, but sadly had um, faded from view over the years. I believe having been overshadowed really by the celebrated stained glass uh, work and illustrations of her husband. Of course, um, when they married, one thing that I would say that I really garnered from reading a lot of the letters um, in the National Library, the Harry and Margaret Clark papers. There's a huge swath of archival material there, much of what I borrowed for the exhibition, letters, photographs, etc. It really uh, shone a light on the relationship that they had, how much they valued each other's work, how much they missed each other when they were apart, and how much they were very, very interested in, in instilling an artistic um, way of thinking and life for their children. Um, this is one of Margaret's earliest surviving drawings, and um, we believe that she more than likely used this particular drawing as one of her scholarship works, which would have been submitted to the South, Lund uh, South Kensington Board of Education. Of course, Margaret would have con uh, received consecutive scholarships while attending the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art, which enabled her to continue her studies. And something like this really does demonstrate her skill as um, not only a portraitist, but as an astonishing uh, drafts person. And that was something that people really did comment on a lot um, after seeing the exhibition. Of course, one of her um, most important uh, tutors at the College of Art was William Orpen. And he used to arrive to Dublin uh, twice yearly um, to teach at the college. And he introduced the nude model to students. Um, he had a much more kind of liberal, liberal um, instruction style and used to take the students off to the likes of the beaches, say, at Port Marnock and Hoth uh, on drawing, sketching uh, trips. And in this, uh, I hope you're able to see it properly, we have, um, we have the nude model being drawn here on the left and the sitter with the feather in her cap is, uh, is Margaret. And uh, another artist here, uh, James Slater, is lying in the foreground. This is a beautiful drawing done by, by Orpen of his students. And he used to refer to, you know, that they were a really happy working family um, at the College of Art. He also did an, a magnificent uh, painting uh, depicting Margaret as an Aran Islander, where she wears this wonderful shawl. And um, this is a, a small little telegram that Orpen sent to Margaret Clark, uh, referring to the renewal of one of her scholarships. And he basically notes on it, you have the scholarship, good wishes, work hard, Orpen. Uh, so he really very much rated her as one of his most promising uh, pupils. As I said, the life drawing class at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art um, was, you know, the whole ethos was very much changed uh, by William Orpen. And you can see in, I hope you can see it there, he is in the, the background here, Orpen, 
looking out at the viewer. And then in profile is Margaret Clark and then Harry Clark and James Slater, um, Ethel Rind, etc. And then in the, they're all drawing the nude model here. Harry uh, sat beside Ethel Rind and Margaret in the foreground. So, as I said, it was a very productive uh, time for her as an artist. And these are just a selection of some of the beautiful life drawings that she did that we acquired um, in the National Gallery in 2007. And it was really that body of work that we acquired that made me realise, gosh, she's a really superb uh, drafts person and wanted to uh, look more into her life and work. And, of course, these are student drawings. So the one here um, in charcoal uh, on the very lower portion of the drawing is noted V good. So basically, possibly somebody like Orpen commenting on, um, you know, ones that he liked. These, um, this particular painting I borrowed from a private collection, um, a beautiful nude uh, study. And then I found this uh, photograph in the National Library of that same nude being painted by Margaret in the Metropolitan School of Art, and James Slater is beside her, another artist, Kitty Jamé, um, seated to the left. But what I liked about this particular painting was the fact that she won lots of awards and medals for her paintings from the female nude uh, in the Board of Education National Art Competitions of 1911 and 13. And in 1916, she submitted one of her nude uh, paintings, which was owned by William Orpen, to the RHA exhibition. Fortunately, however, that particular painting was rejected, as the old academy premises on Abbey Street was destroyed, of course, that year during, during the Easter Rising. So, fortuitous in a way that, um, you know, one of these superb nudes of hers uh, survived, having been rejected. As a student uh, at Art College, she used to go on summer expeditions with fellow students to the likes of Inishir, uh, where she produced not only detailed studies of the island's ancient ruins, but also um, of a lot of her companions dressed as Aran Islanders. And of course, Orpen had done that of her. So it was that same kind of influence obviously coming through. This is a superb work which I borrowed from a private collection and it can be viewed now in the Marion Hotel because we devised a really stunning frame to um, showcase this work because it's a recto and verso. And the great thing about it is that it's a portrait, one of Margaret's earliest por portraits of Harry um, on the front and on the back, a very, very rare painting by Harry of an Aaron child. Uh, so the fact is we have both Harry and Margaret's work um, embodied in the one piece and uh, so it was a really really nice addition to the show both Harry and Margaret used photography quite a bit and uh, you know this is a photograph by Harry of uh, both Ethel Rind, Margaret with this lovely hat uh, on the far right, and Sean Keating with another hat leaning up against the cottage wall with a lot of students or children from um, Inishir. And uh, as I said, they would have utilised a lot of photography, not only uh, utilising photography of their own children, but of um, places like Inishir, etc., for potential compositions in the future, whether it be in painting or for stained glass, etc. The painting that I used for the cover of the catalogue is this absolute stunner from the Ulster Museum of entitled Robin Redbreast. And this is actually of her sister, uh, Mary, who married Harry's brother, Walter. Um, and she was known as Mary or Minnie. And she came down to Dublin when, from County Down when her parents died and ended up living for a period of time with uh, Margaret. And as I said, ended up mar marrying Walter. Very sadly, though, like Margaret, Walter died at a very, very young age as well and left her uh, to raise a, a young family. So he dies in 1930. Harry dies in 1931. Uh, so they both ended up having quite a slip, similar uh, scenario in a way. 
But this beautiful, uh, vibrant portrait of her sister um, is similar to other portrayals she did of strong Irish characters. And as you can see, she places um, the sitter's uh, thumbs tucked into her pockets, uh, which give her a kind of a, a strong, defiant air in this piece. And this is a, these are a few photographs here. This is Harry up above uh, taking photographs in their house in Shankill, um, or sorry, in uh, Harry's father's house, Joshua uh, house in uh, Shankill. And then this is Harry with their ch three children uh, below. As I said, photography featured quite uh, extensively for both Harry and Margaret. And as I said, they as a couple, encouraged uh, from an er early age their three children to live creative lives. And funnily enough, um, you know, uh, Anne ends up working at the Harry Clark Studios, uh, David ends up being an artist, and Michael ends up being a theatre actor. And uh, I think this was a beautiful little uh, addition to the exhibition. As I said, I incorporated quite a bit of archival material, but this was a letter written by Harry to his children from London in 1925. He was in London between October and December of that year, basically overseeing the installation of some windows completed by the Clark Studios, as well as working on some book commissions. And as I said, the letters in the, the National Library really do attest to their real love of their children. And um, in this particular letter, it says... Um, my dear Anne, uh, Michael and David, I loved your letters. They were simply beautiful and uh, the pictures are simply beautiful also. I hope you have uh, elephant shillings still and I, um, if I meet any more, I will uh, keep them in my pocket for you. So it just, you know, very, very uh, sweet letters between the family back and forth. This is a really nice painting that I incorporated again from a private collection uh, entitled Interior of Room from around 1920, which shows Harry um, at home uh, beside his drawing board. And I think it offers a glimpse into the private life of this artistic couple. As a result of the Easter Rising, the Clarks moved in 1916 from their flat on 33 North Frederick Street in Dublin to a house near the sea um, at 36 Mount Marion Avenue in Black Rock, where their three children were born. From 1922, however, they lived at 48 North Circular Road near the Phoenix Park, which remained the family home until Margaret's death in 1961. The funny thing I felt about this particular painting was look at all of the canvases um, on the ground, but nothing on the walls, you know, so a, a real artistic couple at work here. And this is a really beautiful painting, um, again, that I borrowed from the family, uh, entitled Anne with Cat. And of course, Margaret depicted her children at really varying times of their childhood, from infancy, really, right up uh, till adulthood, uh, creating a visual record of their youth. She made alterations to this particular piece um, in order to represent her daughter as a young adult rather than a child. And I think the stylized background of this particular um, Landscape reflects the artist's response, in a sense, to modern art. Even though she was, you know, an academic painter, she was starting to engage maybe with something like this symbolist background with the work of Gauguin or Matisse. And for this particular background, she used a Japanese-inspired uh, printed textile from her own studio as a source for this imaginative backdrop. Now, I think... It was important to include the actual backdrop within the exhibition. So you can really see um, she was, you know, utilizing it uh, very much so for, for that background. But also the fact that she captures really the, the, the daughter, Anne, and her love of cats. In every single photograph of Anne, she's holding a cat. Um, and so uh, that's, that comes across then in the painting. That particular work, Anne with Cat, um, Margaret exhibited in the first Irish exhibition of living art in 1943, which was held at the National College of Art on Kildare Street. 
Now, as I said earlier, some of her drawings are really were really some of the highlights of the exhibition and uh, people were taken aback really about how uh, beautiful her drawings were. In the 1920s, uh, she drew consistently her housekeeper, um, Julia O'Brien. And uh, Julia spent uh, quite a number of years uh, looking after the children and keeping order in the house. Um, and at this time, she also served, as I said, as Margaret's principal model, appearing frequently not only in the drawings but in the paintings. So this stunning uh, drawing here, uh, Juliana, and uh, another work that we have in the collection here uh, entitled Julia with Toothache, and she's noted that um, on the particular drawing. Julia appears, as I said, in a number of the paintings, and this is a painting called Bath Time at the Creche of around 1925 in the gallery's collection. It's quite a curious kind of enigmatic type painting that a lot of people queried um, and wondered about. Uh, but the fact is that I uh, came across this photograph in the National Library of Julia with this uh, collection of children um, on the beach. And this was used literally as a translation then for that uh, back row or procession of children in the background. So how, again, she was utilising um, photography. And this, I believe, was from a family holiday spent uh, at the seaside village of Laytown in County Meath. The Clarks also had a kind of a seaside uh, home or holiday home in Greystones, uh, which they would have uh, gone to quite frequently. This painting uh, is quite unusual, though, uh, even though it's, it's, she's utilising the photograph of the beach scene, it's got very much a studio, uh, artist studio. Um, and as I said, she utilised oddly, uh, but, but not that odd, because Orpen had done it frequently, uh, the same model in the, the painting. So we have Julia here holding uh, the black infant on her knee, and Julia in the background, again, the same, the same person uh, depicted twice within the one painting. And people said, you know, what was the, why was there the inclusion of the black infant in the foreground? And um, I believe, according to the family, it, she was inspired basically by a carved African head uh, that was held on her mantelpiece. So... Not only did she utilise the people within her immediate circle for her models, but she was uh, utilising things from her family home, uh, jugs, basins, stools, etc. Her nephew, Terry, um, in the foreground uh, for her paintings. This was a painting that I borrowed from the Irish News Collection in Belfast, and the title of this painting is either the wife or the haircut, and it dates to around 1926. Uh, this was exhibited in Paris um, and Brussels at the British Artists' Exhibition in 1927 by Margaret. And again, she casts Julia, her housekeeper, as the wife, and she casts Julia's brother, who worked in the kiln room at the Harry Clark Studios, as the husband. It's quite a dramatic painting, um, it's got a lot of theatricality, of course, due to the exaggerated poses, the very, very sharp colours, the dramatic lighting, the abundant kind of drapery in the background. But the wife, of course, adopts a very dominant pose, as you can see here, as she's posed over her husband with scissors in hand. So there's something kind of quite ominous about this painting, too. And I, when I looked at this, I, I drew strong kind of visual parallels to the likes of the story of Samson and Delilah, you know, her, her eradicating his power by, by cutting his hair. But a very, very strong, um, strong picture. And as I said, the 1920s were a very, very active, uh, creative uh, period within Margaret's uh, life. And uh, she created a lot of uh, paintings. They, they weren't commissions, uh, you know, but she utilised these types of paintings to challenge herself as an artist. None more so than this painting, which belongs to the Ulster Museum, entitled Stringbergian of 1927. Now, she exhibited this particular painting most uh, within her lifetime. 
It's based on the enigmatic um, Strindberg's uh, play or expressionist play called The Ghost Sonata, which was basically a melancholic uh, kind of meditation on the tragic state of humanity. In 1925, she had seen the play performed by the Dublin Drama League um, under the title The Spook Sonata with Lennox Robinson in the role of the student. And you can see him here in the grey suit, kind of with his palms outstretched. Two years later, having performed this particular uh, play, he then adopted the same role for her painting. And... In this painting, again, it's a very enigmatic painting. Critics couldn't figure it out. They couldn't establish the meaning behind it at all when it was exhibited first. And she's recreating basically Strindberg's very eerie world of lost souls, where the living mingle basically with a myriad of ghosts, vampires and evil spirits. So it was a very ambitious picture. It's colossal in size. Um, and as I said, mystified Christ critics at the time. She conjures up in this particular work, though, a very Irish landscape, I would say, complete with a crucifix and runes. It certainly is not a literal depiction of the play uh, or an interpretation of the play, which has a distinctly urban setting. So she's evoking basically the universal theme of the play, which is a reflection on the human condition. The work for me calls to mind, though, the likes of William Orpen's allegorical painting, The Holy Well, which is in the National Gallery's collection also. And again, like The Holy Well, this is very, very large in scale. I incorporated in the exhibition as well some beautiful preparatory drawings that she did. And for that uh, particular painting, again, she used the people in her immediate circle, the likes of this little uh, figure up here, Mrs. Gavin, who was a cleaner in the Harry Clark studios. Uh, Dan, who was, as I said, worked in the kiln room. He was depicted as the hanging man in the, in the painting. And, of course, uh, Julia um, also. And, of course... For the, the depiction of Lennox Robinson as the student with his arms outstretched, she looked to the National Gallery of Ireland's painting of um, El Greco's St. Francis receiving the stigmata. And of course, she had come to the National Gallery as a student to copy from the masters. And there is a letter from Orpen actually seeking per permission from the gallery for her to come and do so. So... The likes of this is in one of, of her sketchbooks and, as I said, uh, utilising the sketches, etc., for the final paintings. So, as I said, the, the 1920s were a particularly productive period for Margaret. Um, during this period, she created her most kind of intellectually complex and visually demanding works. Um, she was a highly motivated artist, and during this particular time, the 1920s, she organised her first solo exhibition in 1924, gained full membership of the RHA in 1927, exhibited at the Enoch Talton exhibitions, as well as in London, Brussels, Paris, New York and Boston. So she was incredibly busy at the same time as looking after three children or raising them and coping with her husband's deteriorating health. This is a great portrait of Lennox Robinson, which I borrowed uh, from the Crawford in Cork. And, of course, Lennox not only appeared in her painting uh, Strindbergian, but was a very, very close friend of both Harry and Margaret's. He, of course, was a playwright and director of the Abbey Theatre. And, as I said, in addition to being a very close confidant of the Clarks. In this striking portrait, Margaret, I feel, reveals the dramatist's intellect, capturing what Lady Gregory referred to as his tendency to gloom. <laughs> so, and the great thing about Lennox Robinson was they could very much depend on him. He sourced a lot of commissions for Margaret and offered her great support, both during Harry's illness and uh, following his death in January 1921. On Harry's actual behalf, he was given um, power of attorney as well and oversaw the financial restructuring 
and division of the North Frederick Street premises, um, on which a lot of people depended. A lot of people were working there, um, both uh, creating the stained glass designs and uh, uh, cutting and... Uh, so the business was basically separated out into a church decorating and a stained glass business. And Lennox was very much fundamental to that. This great photo of Margaret uh, and Lennox uh, walking um, along in Dublin. Robinson owned three of Margaret's works, um, two of which I um, exhibited in the exhibition, one entitled The Dressmaker which for me kind of had connections to the fact that Margaret's family in County Down were, you know, involved in the flax uh, trade. And, of course, the, a drawing, a beautiful drawing of his wife, uh, Dolly Robinson, who was Margaret's friend. This is a very, very beautiful, unfinished uh, portrait of Harry that she did. Uh, also very, very poignant uh, work because it was the last portrait she did of him in 1929. She went to visit him in Davos in Switzerland where he was recuperating in a sanatorium for tuberculosis. And he spent really much of the latter part of his life out there, you know, receiving treatment. And of course, in this particular painting, he's holding a newspaper and he is wearing a, a blue dressing gown. And more than likely, she used this particular photograph of him um, out on the balcony of his room in Davos. And as I said, the letters reveal something of, very much something of uh, Harry's homesickness when he was in Davos. And uh, he frequently wrote to Margaret from the sanatorium. One letter from the National Library states, I'm always thinking of you all at number 48. Every little thing, he says, I remember. Even the shaky glass in the hall door has my love. So really very sad because, you know, very shortly afterwards, he, he dies en route back from Switzerland in uh, Cor. So what would I say? She had to deal with a lot at this particular time. Um, but then, you know, she comes upon this incredibly important commission in 1930, uh, which was, she was assigned to do basically five poster designs for the Empire Marketing Board, um, which she executed in 1930. The design illustrates basically, this is called the English Breakfast, and it illustrates the consumption of Irish farm produce at the English breakfast table. So the posters were basically to illustrate the, the trade between the Irish Free State and Great Britain. And they were displayed basically around British towns with the slogan, Empire Buying Makes Busy Factories and things like that. But the key thing was that not only Sean Keating and James Humbert Craig were appointed for this uh, particular commission, but also Margaret. So she was very much at the time uh, highly regarded, having been selected for this important uh, role. And this commission, of course, came at an incredibly difficult time in Clark's life when her husband, as I said, his, his health was deteriorating rapidly at this stage. This is another one of that uh, series uh, of the, the um, Empire Marketing Board looking at the Irish Free State and Great Britain. And of course, Ireland is in this grey shawl where Hibernia and then um, Britannia is in this billowing um, satin uh, shawl and uh, they're alongside uh, their, their countries. So... It was quite a, you know, dramatic uh, poster designs. And uh, as I said, they came, they were an important commission for her, but they came at a very, very difficult time. Following Harry's uh, premature death in 1931, she did become the director of the Harry Clark Studios, but continued to paint from a studio at the top of the North uh, Frederick Street premises. However, time constraints and the added responsibilities, of course, of rearing um, children, etc., curtailed her output. In 1932, she personally bought back one of her husband's last works, the Geneva Window, from the government. 
commissioned in 1926 for the League of Nations International Labour Building in Geneva, but which had sadly been rejected in 1930 due to its supposed inappropriate content. The majority of Clark's later exhibits at the RHA and her second solo exhibition of 1939 were made up of portraits, landscapes and still lives, something that were seen as more financially, of course, viable. And um, But throughout the 1930s, I would have said she taught at the RHA schools. Um, And once she finished finished exhibiting at the RHA in 1953, she actually became part of the selection committee. She was an artist, of course, grounded in the academic tradition, uh, but she was nonetheless, I believe, quite open to modern developments. She championed very much the next generation of Irish artists, like the likes of Patrick Pye, and was involved in independent artist groups. She was a founding member as well of the Irish Exhibition of Living Art. She was on the organising um, ex- uh, committee as well for Evie Hone's very large uh, retrospective of 1958. And at the time of Margaret's death in 1961, she was immersed in cataloguing the work of Mani Jellett. So she was, you know, remained right until the end an incredibly busy um, person. For me, this exhibition was a real revelation because it brought together a body of work that really nobody had seen together, um, certainly in a very, very long time. And the likes of Nicola Gordon Bow, again, for me, it was a real, it was a real honour. Uh, the fact that she selected the catalogue that I did for this show as one of her three favourites of 2017. And of course, poor Nicola has passed on uh, now. But she was very, very excited about an exhibition like this because, as I said, she felt that Margaret was a very deserving artist. Aidan Dunn wrote about the exhibition. Margaret Clark was a key figure in Irish art and a new show illustrates how her portraits deserve greater recognition beyond her partnership with Harry Clark. An independent spirit aims to redress the balance and, as the title implies, allows us to see Margaret Clark as an artistic personality in her own right. Aidan Dunn actually voted the exhibition in his top 10 uh, must-sees of 2017. And the critic Tom Walker for Apollo uh, International Art magazine said about the exhibition that it was a hidden highlight at the National Gallery of Ireland and continued that smaller is sometimes better. Indeed, the assiduous use of archival material, he said, looking at photographs, letters and sketchbooks, can illuminate artworks to great effect. The local and the little known can be just as compelling as the world's greatest hits. And he went on to say that the curator um, has done much to bring the nature of Clark's under-regarded achievements to light. Let's hope the gallery, amid its renovation and rejuvenation, continues to do such shows so well. Hopefully. (laughs) Okay. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.